interesting. Okay. Um, I think. Um, Yeah, thanks for staying here. Um, so in the next part, I will be focusing on um, entity typing. So this part, um, most of the work assume that the entity already, entity mentions already recognized from the text. So it treats the entity mentions as an input to the next component, which is the entity typing. But some, a little small portion of the work actually are doing this jointly, which means they extract the entity uh, as well as recognizing their types in a joint manner. Uh, we'll introduce both of them. So um, recall that we previously partitioned these text corpus into two different uh, characteristics, where we have a general domain versus specific domain, and uh, whether it's a following the formal or regular grammars versus using irregular grammars. And um, so we also want to partition um, the methods into, into these, these two big categories. So first we talk about the general domain and formal corpus. And there's um, different assumptions on, on each of them. For the general domain formal corpus, we're assuming a good amount of data is available um, for the chaining. And some primitive NLP methods, such as part of switch tagging uh, and more sophisticated one like non-phrase chunking and dependency parsing actually are pretty robust given this um, um, corpus. So then they can provide a decent and robust features to the um, chaining process. And we are assuming that most, that most of the entities mentioned in this text can be found in the knowledge base. So then naturally you can seek um, for knowledge base for help. <clears throat> there are five types of, or five families of methods can be um, pretty, um, working pretty well in this case but we will be focusing on only the first three because the last two actually are pretty effective for domain specific and ir irregular corpus and we will introduce in more details on that when we dive into that part. So we will be focusing on the first three ones which are the supervised, the semi-supervised and the entity linking methods for the general domain corpus. And we see a lot of um, standard classification method and also the sequence labeling model that we pre previously talked about can work under the supervised setting. Recall that we have the um, IOB representation of a sentence we talked before. Essentially, it's trying to, let's say, uh, put a label on each token of the sentence. And in the entity typing case, we are putting the labels like beginning of a person entities mention, or inside of a person entity mention, or not an entity mention, like O, and uh, like a beginning of an organization entity or inside of an organization entity. So basically, you're trying to classify each of the token into the corresponding label. That's a diagram A. We call it IOB encoding for the classification. And the problem setting will be classify each token is into a corresponding label. And di diagram B actually assumes that the entity boundaries are given, meaning that the entity dimension is already extracted. So you only need to do is classify each entity dimension into the corresponding label, like person or location. <coughs> they share, um, all of these supervised methods share this chaining and texting framework, like wh whatever we learned from the machine learning textbook. We collect a set of chaining documents, and we're trying to put our labels back into the corpus, meaning that we label each tokens or any, any dimensions by its entity ties, and we extract the features surrounding um, all the things, and we change the classifier. Later on, when you have new texting documents coming up, either it's a single document or a text corpus, we just need to run this classifier to label each token or any dimensions and output the results. So actually, we found out that feature is the key in this scenario. Instead of trying to proposing more, sophistic more sophisticated classifier model. So for features, we have word level, you have a paragraph level, or document level, or even corpus level. Like in word level, 
like punctuations um, and capitalizations and the depart of speech tags and the words function are all useful features to explore. And for document and corpus level, you care more about the word statistics or co-occurrence statistics. For example, the word and phrase frequency, the co-occurrence, and including the significant scores we talked, we introduced just before. And a particular case is the distributional features is found very useful. It's trying to say, um, could you look at the context of each um, candidates and trying to induce a distribution over these context words and then class these words into a rough category and put in the class, type, class label as the features for the further training. So we're gonna first review some standard classification model. For example, decision tree and support vector machine and they are working um, for the diagram B, which is taking the pre-extracted n-dimensions as input, and then you put the type, uh, put the label for each n-dimension. <coughs> so, decision tree is pretty familiar to all of you. Um, the good thing about decision tree is you actually can derive pretty in interpretable rules during your training of this tree. Because when you look in the paths of the tree, and you look in on the branches of the tree, you, you figure out which features are important and which feature can really help you to narrow down the types candidate for each any dimensions. But the disadvantage are also there. The error prone in the multi-class classification um, due, due to the small training examples and also pruning the tree is pretty expensive. So when you look at like support vector machine, <coughs> It's still basically a bi binary classification um, a problem regarding each entity type following the diagram B. And you have the assumption that the negative examples co-occurring with an entity um, <coughs> are actually the, the, the entities that are not the target types. And we found out that, and the paper actually found out that the quadratic kernels give the best performance. So what's more, um, starting from this decision tree and support vector machine, this kind of standard classification, they follow in diagram B, uh, which means they take the pre-extracted entity dimension as the input and trying to classify them independently uh, with each other, meaning that they are making independent uh, uh, decisions. The sequence label models actually want to do these things in, in a kind of a close neighborhood manner, meaning that when they're making each decisions, for example, this deciding what's the label for jobs, this token, they actually look around, they look at Steve and find out that it's already labeled as a um, beginner of a person entity name. And they look in, in the future, find out there's a words, uh, the token on the right side. And they, have, um, they all have their features already extracted. So sequence label model trying to take the future observation and then their labels all together to make the decision for the current token. <coughs> There's a bunch of uh, sequence model and um, Dr. Han just introduced like hidden Markov model, max entropy Markov model and conditional random field. They have um, pretty different assumptions on the independence of the feature and whether they are looking to the future observation or their labels. And the state of the run methods on this part, for example, standard, uh, sorry, Stanford NER, they leverage the conditional random field and a whole bunch of different features, including the distributional feature I just introduced. And they, they claim they have the um, um, best performance when you provide them enough training data. So to infer, um, to infer the models, there are three different strategies. You can do a totally greedy ways, meaning that from the left token to the very end of the sequence, you look at the token one by one, and then you make decisions and you never look back. It's pretty fast, but make commit errors. <coughs> Return the inference on the other hand, is trying to have the global um, optimal sequence uh, from the whole bunch of um, candidate space. It leverage dyna dynamic programming or, or memorization so it has the exact solutions, but it's a little bit harder to implement um, the long distance state stage 
uh, inter, inter, interactions. While if you look at the bin inference, it's actually a pretty good trade-off between the gradient inference and the Viterb inference. Seems at each position, it look at the top k complete sequences um, available and then trying to extend them in each local way, meaning that <coughs> you don't need to look at the whole entire candidate space, but you only look at the top ones. It, it is still pretty fast. And even if it's inexact, it sometimes may fall off the um, optimals, um, optimal sequence. But empirically, actually the results give, uh, are pretty good. So from the supervised setting to the semi-supervised setting, so the assumption is that um, besides the whole bunch of fully labeled sentences or the um, 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 corpus, you actually have a, access to an even much larger uh, bunch of documents. And those are un annotated documents. Rather, can you further enhance the performance by leveraging the extra bunch of annotated corpus? So they, they are looking forward to say, let's say, whether can we further improve the results with this whole bunch of extra um, annotated corpus, or whether can we reduce the label data a little bit, or reduce the requirements of the size of the label data by, by, by providing the extra annotated document and keep the performance pretty comparable. So that's their um, hope. And the assumption is that the extra uh, amount of unlabeled data actually share the distribution or the data statistics with the labeled one so that you can make the model di um, generation pretty consistent. So the insights, um, there's actually two kinds of um, approach to go along this way. And they, sh they, they do two different insights. The first one is uh, if you try to derive some extra features out of this annot annotated corpus, actually these features can be fit into those standard or sequence model label training process, and these features can boost the performance. That's one way. The other way is trying to say, can I extend those um, um, classifier or sequence models to try to model this unannotated part in the model jointly? So that's the second way. Let's first look at the first way. <clears throat> so. There's a lot of feature representation can be derived on an, on an annotated corpus. For example, the distributional word representation we talk about is simply just the words um, on the context window. And you can even cast them into different um, <coughs> semantic groups. And then you use the group's ID as the feature to fit into the classifier. For example, you can use brown clusters, which are pretty general uh, cluster derived on the English corpus. And you can even do word embedding, a whole bunch of um, distribu distributed word representation, including the neural language model. They can also be derived from the unannotated corpus and then fit into those um, classifier. What else? Um, if you want to extend the existing models to incorporate the unable data, that's also feasible. So the thinking about like a hidden Markov model, it's a, it's a generating model. So using the expectation, expectation maximization framework, it's already you can treat those unlabeled data as data which has missing label and then um, joint them together in the training process. But what about the discriminated models like conditional random view or max entropy Markov model? You actually want to um, leverage some kind of regularization or, or kind of uh, optimization criteria to include this unlabeled data. So there, there's two examples here from two different papers. The first one is using an entropy regularization on the unlabeled data part, and you jointly optimize the original objective function plus this entropy regularization, and then you can model the unlabeled part. The second one is to use the generalized expectation criteria, which is a new optimization criteria, to optimize the original conditional random field model. That's also a possible way to incorporate the unlabeled part. <coughs> And the third part is remember that we assume most of the entities in the text actually exist in the knowledge base. So anti-linking become a pretty durable way to, um, let's say, link the entities to the knowledge base, look at the entries in the knowledge base, look at the candidate types in the knowledge base, figure out the most possible types from the knowledge base candidates. 
we, uh, we have a whole bunch of um, very rich um, entity taxonomy, including free base or pro base. And then they have a very good number of types. Some of them have uh, the type hierarchy organized into a tree structure or just flat or just uh, or, or DAG. <coughs> So when you try to use the entity linking techniques to do entity typing, you are actually assuming that the linked entity do not have type ambiguity in terms of the target type, has, type set. For example, if you link Washington DC to the, um, I mean the, just the city into the free base entity, in the free base actually you find out that this Washington DC entity actually have a lot of different types, including government or location. So which one is exactly the one you're trying to refer to under the certain context? That's actually a pretty challenging problem. And uh, it should be started independently out of these entity linking techniques. So you, if you want to use the entity linking techniques, you have to make sure that the linked entities does not have type ambiguity in terms of the type, target types, type set. Otherwise, you need to handle this part by yourself. And, the, and to do this entity linking, there's actually um, a lot of different signals we can use. Uh, the simplest one is to just look at the context of this entity mentioned in the raw corpus, and also look at the context of the entries in the knowledge base to try to match whether they they share in the context. That's the context similarity. And you also want to make sure that all the entities within a document or a paragraph, they are sharing the same topics. That's the topic co coherence. And you also make sure the entities you link to are pre uh, kind of relatively popular in the knowledge base and in the current corpus. That's entity popularity. And sometimes you're trying to say, can I link multiple entities in a paragraph jointly because they are sharing a lot of things like the background context. That's jointly, uh, that's collective entity linking technique. <coughs> But obviously, if the assumption breakdown, I mean, if the, there's not a lot of entities in this corpus can be found out in knowledge base, you've, the performance of entity linking techniques will face with very poor record. And in many cases, because the entities are manually curated in the knowledge base, you don't have a lot of descriptions about these entities, especially for those newly emerged entities um, in like say like past one year or several months. So the entity, uh, so the context similarity signal actually will fail in this case. So whether can we disambiguate entities without relying on knowledge base? The answer is yes. There are um, at least two approaches. We have pro uh, one of it's from Shi Wang, uh, published in 2012 in the dot 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 paper. It's working on, let's say, if the you are provided a set of ad hoc homogeneous entity names, it can do the ambiguation um, automatically without looking, even looking at the knowledge base. Or if you provide a little bit information about knowledge base. So Yang Li published a paper in 2013 KDD. It's trying to mine additional evidence in the corpus to try to disambiguate these entity names. <coughs> okay, so after looking, um, after looking for the methods for general domain corpus. Now, what is really interesting is that, um, I think it's interesting for most of you is that, what if you have a, like a, your treasure small bunch of documents that are not public and it has pretty special domain characteristics. Let's say, um, let's say the customer complaints data from the American Airlines, that's one example, or you have the, um, your Michael Brock data, or you have the Yelp reviews, all these are pretty domain specific. And user will have a lot of informal grammars and punctuation and capitalization things in there. So many assumptions just changed. First of all, you don't have the sufficient amount of label data to change those supervised or semi-supervised sequence models. And they won't perform well in this case. We will validate that in the later experiments. <coughs> And many of the NLP features also fail. Let's say part of speech could be somehow robust in this case because 
as well as um, as long as you are speaking English in a kind of general way. So the part of speech, you should use the right part of speech for each token in that sense. But how do you form the noun phrases like in and out for the Yelp review? And how do you organize the sentence, um, uh, make clear the relations between different objectives, subjective, and, and so on, that, like the dependency parsing tree, they no longer work well on the specific domain, informal corpus. And only a very small portion of entities could be found in the knowledge base in this sense. So we in particularly want to take a look at the wiki supervised setting and distantly supervised setting. So the wiki supervised setting is, is still kind of similar to the setting in the entity dimension detection part. So you only need to provide a small set of um, um, entity names with their types. Let's say you have a, a several sentence. You don't need to fully annotate it each sentence. Let's say uh, you don't fully need to annotate Steve Jobs and Apple Inc. You may only need to, let's say, I know Steve Jobs. I would just annotate it as a person. If there's a company names after war, I don't recognize them. I can just leave it there. So the annotation work is pretty light here, and it's very durable. <coughs> That's the wiki supervised setting. And what is even better, the distance supervised setting is assuming that you can try to um, leverage the Freebase and Wikipedia and trying to plug in the entities in the wiki, uh, like Wikipedia and Freebase back into the corpus, trying to plug in as much as possible and let the algorithm take care of the rest of the things. So that's, uh, that's the benefit. Let's take a look at a wicked supervised setting. So you have the large annot annotated corpus available, but you have a small set of labeled entity names, or we call them seeds here on the corpus. So you need to put some assumption on these seeds anyway. You need to make sure that these seeds have sufficient occurrence in the corpus. If you just label a seed, let's say, um, something only occur once in the corpus, then it's basically giving no information to the other, um, other parts of the algorithm. And then you need to make sure the entity names do not have type ambiguity, <coughs> like the Washington DC case, you don't want to label Washington DC because you have you have no idea about um, if you, if you label Washington DC as a garment in this sentence, you have no idea about what it, what it, what is the types in the, the other context. And then you want to make sure that the entity names you label is trying to cover all the entity types eventually. You don't want to bias to a certain like person type, so you only label one or two organization types, ma making the classifier pretty biased. For example, this setting can be interpreted by this example very naturally. You take New Orleans and Texas as like two unambiguous names in this case, and dive into the unlabeled corpus, and our algorithm want to give you more names on location, like Louis Anna and what, like say Washington DC. It's it's not like it, it has the name ambiguity in this case, but we will make clear that later. <coughs> First, pattern-based bootstrapping method is, has pretty long history. I think it started for almost 30 years. So people won't naturally will think the context patterns surrounding an entity names, providing pretty good cues on the types of the entity. So if you can leverage the redundancy in the document, let's say, you find out a pattern like companies such as they occur in many places of the set uh, of the corpus, and then each time you will find out the entity mentioned on the right side of this pattern actually is a good company name. So, starting from the seeds like Goldman Sachs or Microsoft, you find out more company names like Google, Morgan Stanley, and Facebook. Their framework is a iterative or a like incremental process, starting from the C entities and the unlabeled corpus. They first use these C entities and plug in back to the corpus, and which, which is just labeled the data. And then they create a pattern surrounding these C entities, like the context, context window pattern. And they're trying to say evaluate these patterns 
using the C entities called curl wisdom. Maybe it's only a small portion of these patterns are pretty good context patterns for like person name or pretty good context pattern for organization name. So they select the top K patterns and just ship them into the pattern repository saying that these are good patterns, I will use them in my later steps. So then using these patterns, they can extract some entities, some more entities besides those seeds. And these entities candidates can be also scored by the patterns quality. And then these entities just add them into the seed repository. And then in the later step, they will extract more patterns and more entities and so on and so forth. That's the basic idea of this bootstrapping process. So then they actually have this mutual exclusion assumption that the positive example for one type are negative for the other type. You need to make sure these assumptions always stands there. That's why you, don't, you, you have the assumption on the seeds that there's no net ambiguity. So starting from these assumptions to make the pattern-based bootstrapping method work well, you actually have three key questions to answer. One is that how do you induce the patterns? And how do you evaluate each pattern? And how do you promote the entities? To induce the patterns, there are quite a lot of different ways. Starting from, you just take the windows of the context words before or after a label any dimensions. And you can put a little bit of the part of speech restriction to make sure the pattern looks like, looks meaningful to people. Like pay a visit to some place is become a pay a determinator visit to some place or something is located in. <clears throat> and you can further do literal patterns. It's, this one is a little bit different from the previous one is that you're trying to take the context window before and after an entity tag so let's say if you already tag Steve Jobs as a person, you have a front tag per PER or, the, or the, uh, the back tag dash PER. So you want to derive a pattern surrounding, let's say, the back tag PER. And how can we further improve this? The NLP people actually try to use the lexical syntactic patterns. It's just basically a, a extra level of the context patterns because you're trying to say, map those um, verb to the passive verb or, or like other verb, or you try to map the victim into this is a subjective. So the pattern is looking like subjective plus a passive verb now. It's more abstract, so you are expecting to match more instance in the corpus in a kind of a restricted way. <clears throat> so this, there's also a trigger word based methods, which is pretty interesting, I think. It's trying to say, if you have a lot of these context pattern, like expression of something in, expression of something, mRNA, I don't know what is it. Maybe it's a it's kind of a medical term, an expression of the another entity gene. So you have a lot of these context patterns starting with the same word. So if the expression is a dominated word in this case, or we call them trigger word in this case, can we um, summarize this a bunch of context pattern? Um, starting with this trigger word expression to a automata, and then you only need to do is take this automata, go back to the corpus to match the instance. It's pretty data driven way, and I I, I like it a lot. <clears throat> then after you have some nice patterns induced in this case, you need to evaluate them. So let's look at a particular example here, which I think can make the problem pretty clear. If you have a look at this example, I own a dog named Tommy. I run with my pet dog. I also nap with my pet cat. I own a car. So you see two patterns can be extracted here. The first one is my <coughs> pet something. The second one is own something. So both of these patterns co-occurred with a positive example, which is the dog here. They also co-occur with, let's say my pet X co-occur with an unlabeled instance cat and on the X pattern co-occur with unlabeled instance car. So now they, if you only look at the positive entities and negative entities, they, no matter what happened, they will be scored the same. So you have no way to tell which pattern is better. 
So in this case, the score assigned to this, both of these patterns will be the same. So what if we look at the unlabeled entities, like cat versus car here? If you know about that, cat actually is more similar to dog than car did. Whether you can score my pet X is a better, pet, better pattern to recognizing a, an animal in this case. So that's the base idea of leverage and unlabeled entities uh, to score the pattern. And the password only ignore these unlabeled una entities or assuming they all are negative, this is pretty aggressive. And they're doing both. But the better way is to, let's say, leverage some external sources to figure out that a cat is better, it's closer to dog than closer to a car. So then you can score the pattern in a better way. Finally, it's the entity promotion part. So basic idea is to take look look around um, what is the patterns co-occurring with these entities and look at their quality. If an entity is always co-occurring with some high quality patterns in these types, they are obviously are pretty good candidates for this type. And you can also incorporate the entity domain popularity and more heuristics you can think about to to let, to promote the entities. But overall for pattern-based bootstrapping methods, the limitation is also quite obvious. So because they are doing these bootstrapping methods in the entity name level, meaning that all the Washington, all the entity name Washingtons is actually treating as the same object or the same node in this bootstrapping process. So they will finally only assign one confident types to this entity name. Let's say, maybe finally, due to the corporate buyers, Washington DC is assigned with a location, so you have no chance to figure out, actually, Washington DC is, a, is referring as a government types of entity in this certain context. That's a very big disadvantage. And the error aggregation is another problem, saying that once you promote some incorrect seeds to the repository, we just get aggregate to make more, um, to promote more wrong patterns and so on and so forth. So people trying to improve this pattern scoring part by taking a context classifier instead of just some rule-based um, scoring functions. <clears throat> so they try to learn this context classifier for any promotion part. It simply says, you look at the window uh, let's say if if you have disease names and the, the left three words is worse di diagnosis with and the right three words are after text showed so then you train the classifier using this bag of words you can take their uh, part of street tag you can take by grand tri grand of these words you can do whatever you can on these windows and you train the classifier using let's say support vector machine and to score this ND. And the interesting thing they did is they're trying to do this cross category bootstrapping to further refine this contextual classifier. The basic idea is saying that part the positive examples of one type serves as negative for the other type. So then you when you train in this classifier, you have some positive labels and this provides you the way to assign some negative labels to them. <clears throat> but um, still they assume that the, the entity mentions are already extracted in this case. They, in the paper, they are using the non-phase trunker. They're thinking about in a specific domain, the non-phase trunker can even, can, even can even fail. So this actually are pretty risky things to do, is trying to take all the non-phase as the candidates. And they need to make sure the seeds are semantically unambiguous. So in the in the work in, in this work they actually done a lot of efforts to trying to make the seeds clean so that the classifier have good performance. <clears throat> and the limitation of them is still you have the error aggregations also faced by the pattern based bootstrapping methods. And and you also need to make sure you have enough context to train the classifier. Let's say for some um, infrequent entity names. You don't have enough context. And then the classifier obviously will not be pretty 
uh, will not be effective. So next one is trying to think about a corpus as a unified graph and then conduct some graph-based semi-surprise learning. Because many corpus can be naturally represented as graph, like think about um, you have context pattern, you have these entity candidates, you can build a bipartite graph be between this um, context pattern and entity candidates where the links representing the um, very confident co occurs between these two types of objects and the linked ways can be like say point wise mutual inform information. <coughs> so then the entity typing problem is simply like you propagating the type information from the seed entities along the graph to the other entities candidates. And they are also <coughs> assuming that the, the candidate is already extracted and has pretty good quality. Otherwise you are propagating just noise to each other and very important assumptions, I call it smoothly assumptions here is sh make sure that the graph you are building is really meaningful. This means that if two instances are similar according to the graphs, they re they the, the similarity on the graph structure really means their type labels are pretty similar. If this assumption doesn't stand, the whole work just, um, just cannot work well. So let's break down these things into several steps. Starting from the very important graph construction. So what is the nodes in the graph? It could be the entity candidates, the context patterns. You can also use the group membership, like you take in this web table and then you figure out these uh, several entities actually belonging to the same groups according to the table or the web list and so on. And after you have these nodes, how do you find the links between each other? You can just build a dense graph, but that's obviously not scalable in the web scale. But uh, you can do the k nearest neighbor or the e nearest e neighborhood graph. And how do you weight each links? You can do just binary, or you can use the co-occurrence measures like pointwise mutual information. And you can even compute a feature-based similarity between the nodes to build up the weights for the link. And you can do metric learning or local reconstruction methods. So. I'm not going to dive into details of this. You can look at the references for more details. <clears throat> so suppose such high quality graph is already constructed and it meets the assumption, the smoothness assumption, meaning that the link, if, if two nodes have high link weights in the graph, meaning that they're sharing, uh, they are highly likely to share the same class table. So you can have a lot of algorithms to learn from the graph. You can do label propagation like starting from random walk or graph Laplacian. And two, you can use factor graph, this kind of um, graphical model to model this graph where the variable nodes meaning the type means the type distribution on a edit candidate and the factor nodes meaning the fitness functions on this um, variable smooth assignments. So you can put this smoothness as a one factor here and you can use and you can also put assumption on the seed matching factor and the regularization factor and so on. <coughs> so manifold regularizations it's a pretty powerful techniques here because all this um, all the label propagation methods here is following the transductive learning paradigm. Um, meaning that they, they are non-parametrics and once you learn these models, you can only be applied on the current um, corpus. But if you want to generalize them to the, um, to the new corpus coming up, you have to train a um, <coughs> in, in, inductive classifier in this case. So manifold regularization can help you to, let's say, combine this regularization we say somehow <coughs> loss functions, let's say this could be a support vector machine or something else, and then you can learn an inductive classifier in this case while incorporating the graph structure. So let's see, um, we recall that we are saying feature is the king for traditional um, supervised methods. And in this setting, actually the graph construction is also the key. It's just like the feature engineering for the classifier and the, the advantage is you actually, it's pretty flexible to incorporate different signals into the graph. You can take um, things from knowledge base, 
from the web list web table. You can take things from your domain dic dictionaries and so on. So since you can do this um, learning process in a parallelized way, which is very scalable to large data, still the limitation is you cannot decide the exact type for each entity mentions because the, the nodes in the graph is still on the surface name level. So it's not an entity mention. So the, the Washington DC um, challenges still happens here. And it's pretty sensitive to the seeds. So um, the next category, we want to say, can we get rid of those small number of high quality seeds? Because you need to put assumptions on these seeds. You need to make sure they have sufficient occurrence, they are unambiguous, they are evenly um, distributed. So what if we just take the knowledge base and plug back to the corpus and see what we can get? So make, make the process fully automatic because the entity information in the knowledge base is so rich, so we call it distance supervision for entity typing. The, this is a general workflow for distance supervision. Let's say you are taking a raw, raw corpus, which is totally unannotated. And you first identify the entity mentions from the text. Let's say you find out that Kabul and Washington are an interesting entity. You have Washington, Boston, and San Francisco. All these are, pre, are already extracted by some ways. And then <clears throat> You, you try to see whether you can link these entity candidates to the knowledge base. Let's say you, if you know that Australia it's, can be linked to Wikipedia and find out the types of government, and this Golden Beers, it's a sport team in the uh, free base. So this provides you the initial set of seeds um, to propagate the information to other unlabeled entities. And then you, you have an assumption here that the linked entities are confidently mapped, it. M meaning that if you have like 0.1% confidence on these linkings, then probably you will make errors, you will commit the errors to the propagation stages, so we will say no to this such linking. <coughs> so um, I'm going to introduce at least three kinds of um, different techniques following this diagram, starting from this multi-class, multi-label classification. So the idea of, of this method is very straightforward. You're thinking about that after they project the entity, uh, the knowledge base into the corpus, they have some seeds in the corpus. They can just do standard classification models on this corpus. But a big disadvantage is that not all uh, almost not all the sentences are not fully annotated, m meaning that you only have maybe one or two entities um, labeled for each sentence, but you are missing like say three or four other entities. So what would be the performance of these models when you, let's say, when your percentage of the annotation is very poor by the knowledge base? So um, just it's it it's a very it's it's actually a big challenges to in this case so <clears throat> again such uh, this category is still assume that the entity mentions are already pre-extracted from the text and the features they are using actually can be um, robustly computed so think about if they are requiring dependency parsing structures or the uh, some um, gra grammar grammatical structures. If in the current corpus it's not gonna to work, they cannot they cannot take such features. So this also limits the power of the classi classifier. But the good thing is they allowed one entity mentions to have multiple fibrant types, and they figure out a way to automatic automatically label the data using. Wikipedia ankle links. So their training corpus is actually just the Wikipedia corpus where you have the ankle links and the ankle links is linking to some other entities and this provide the very nature training corpus like this one. And they need to 
use some heuristic and frequency to further filter these C sets to make sure that those assumptions on the seats will be um, will, will be okay to stand. <coughs> so here's the pi pipeline for their methods. Let's say st starting from the labeled text corpus from Wikipedia, like he attends Harvard University, you first um, need to segment this an annotated corpus to find out the entity mentions in the sentences. Let's say Harvard University is identified as an entity mentioned. And uh, in this case, the Dave Grill is also a entity mentioned is identified from the segmentation process. And then they change this classifier to tag Harvard University and tag the David Grill into different categories. So the features they are using range from just unigrants to bigrants to part of switch tag, the work, the brown work cluster, all the things we talked about in the previous big feature tables. They they try to leverage this as much as possible. But let's say, still in many domains, you even don't have the su distance supervision like Wikipedia corpus, which means that um, if you use Wikipedia corpus, it's still kind of pretty general um, uh, domain knowledge. It cannot be generalized to a specific domain we are talking about. And the second way is, let's say, if you link the, uh, the entity to the knowledge base and figure out their types, you can still leverage the label propagation idea and you need to make sure there's no name ambiguity among these seeds. So the link entities serve as the seeds in this graph and then they're trying to use the context information as the bridge between these entity um, candidates. Let's say you can use the relation phrase serve as a bridge to propagate the information between two entity candidates where they share many relation phrases. So still, you need to construct the graphs. You need to do the feature engineering that necessary to make the whole thing work. <coughs> um, in this work, they leverage the noun phrase as the candidate. And they have a very magical bi binary classifier. They try to use the Google book engram as the feature. And then they look at the timestamps of the engrams. Let's say if, if you see a really good burst of these timestamps of, of, of these entities are frequently mentioned in the recent years. It's probably a very interesting entity to people versus that if you see a entity is no longer frequently mentioned in the recent 10 years, it's, it's not an entity anymore by this classifier. And then they leverage the assertions, which is the just entity relation to entity triple extracted by the open IE pipeline Though these are assertions actually bridge different entity candidates through the relation phrases, and you can propagate the types from the seed entities through these relations to other unlabeled entities. Just like this way, <coughs> you, have, you have these a, a bunch of textual relations, and you find out that they, have, uh, they, they are sharing many um, this bunch of relations are sharing this bunch of entity candidates and they are likely can be predicted as very close types. And another way is to assume that we are not trying to link the entities to the knowledge base, but we are assuming that you already have a knowledge base about the entity pattern, uh, but sorry, about the relation patterns. So if you assume there's res existence of a repositive of relation patterns already organized in a type signature taxonomy. And let's say the party pattern is actually one example here. So then you only need to do is you try to plug these relation patterns back to the corpus and then take a look at the entity dimensions surrounding those patterns and try to derive a score functions to evaluate the, co uh, the, the, the quality scores for the entities in terms of each target type. <coughs> so the insights here is that the type signatures of the co-occurring relation patterns provide very good cues for the types of the entity candidates. And then they further 
impose this type disjointness constraints, meaning that some pair of types actually cannot happen simultaneously on the same entities at the same times. So in this way, they can easily formulate a integer linear programming problem to incorporate this type jointness, whereas the, um, the, like, the aggregate likelihood measures how likely a certain entity dimensions is belonging to a certain types using the variation patterns as the cues. So after we re reviewed this, all of this um, work, so we found out that they actually share uh, at least three challenges here. The first one is, remember that all of them assuming that there's uh, some good way to extract the entity dimensions. Um, as you can see, they, use, they, they already built a binary classifier out of the Google Books Angrid. That's one way. They also leverage the non phase trunker, and they, they also have some rule-based things to derive these entity dimensions. So the question now is, can these methods generalize very well or always work for different domain-specific corpora with irregular grammar? So we are arguing that that must not always be the truth. <clears throat> and because many of these, let's say, non phase chunkers, they are trended on general domain corpus, actually, like news articles, which are clean and grammatical, can then be applied to, like, to Yelp's review or tweaks. And training these classifiers already make use of different linguistic features, like the semantic parsing trees. So, what if these features are already not effective? Then, what is the meaning of this training process? So if we really look at a specific dynamic or emerging corpus, so we are wondering that we need to propose something even better for extracting the entity dimensions. The second one is still the Washington, the Washington example. <clears throat> Multiple entities can share the same surface names. In this case, the first one, the first Washington is referring to a Spock team versus the second one is referring to the U.S. government, and third one is trying to say the capital city. But most of the previous methods, they've simply aggregated all these names into one node in the data model, meaning that you finally only derive one single type for Washington, either the U.S. government or the U.S. capital city, depending on the data set you have. So finally, you have no idea about under a certain context, like the third one, this is the US capital city instead of the government. So <clears throat> what we want to do is instead of just aggregating these data and losing some information, we want to derive the exact type for each entity dimension. Can we do that? <clears throat> and the third one is context sparsity. As you notice, most of the methods that are actually leveraging somehow this context, either a context window or the relation pattern or the relation phrases, notice that people have a vast variety of ways of mentioning relations between different entities. Some ways are pretty popular, like devastate. Some ways are pretty um, just um, personal ways, like cause widespread devastation in. As the frequency show from the real data set, they are pretty um, unevenly distributed. So a critical problem here is can you resolve this, all these synonymous relation phrases into some canonicalized form so that they still help the propagation process in a very principled way. <clears throat> So resolving the infrequent context will be the key to all the previous methods. And so we are going to introduce this class type work. It's also published in this conference. Uh, I think the talk is tomorrow morning. But the good thing here is you don't need to go to the talk again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so from the name of the class types, what we want to emphasize is that we want to cast those synonymous relation phrases into some um, meaningful clusters. 
So then this contact sparsity can be resolved. And we are trying to improve the anti-dimension detection part to trying to make it really domain independent and even language independent, like the, the results we show in the previous phrase mining part. <coughs> Let's review the problem definitions here. It's slightly different from the previous problem definition. Excuse me. Let's say a domain-specific corpus is coming to you, in front of you, and you have access to a general knowledge base, like free base, and you predefine a set of target types that you are interested in for this specific corpus. For example, food, restaurant, and like location organization for Yelp's review, or you have a person location event for news, uh, NYT news corpus, or you have this event still event person location for the tweets. <clears throat> so what we want to do is the problem consists of two major components. The first one is detect the anti mentions from the corpus and for this domain specific corpus in a very effective and efficient way. <clears throat> the second one is to categorize these anti dimensions by the target types or not of the interest types. So using the distance supervision coming from the knowledge base. <clears throat> so regarding the three key challenges we just identified, so our solutions is designed specifically to tackle each of these challenges. So if you look at the domain restriction part, we're actually designing a domain agnostic phrase mining algorithms that are introduced, is somehow introduced in the previous slides when we're talking about this part of speech constraint non-phrase collocation methods, but we will talk more about that <coughs> in later. So taking these approaches, we can extract the anti-dimensions with minimal linguistic or domain assumption, meaning that our method can be easily applied to, let's say, Arabic and Chinese with, without doing any like changes, and we can apply to different domains without tweaking the algorithms to adapt to the nature of different domains. So it's really domain independent method for extracting the entity mentioned. <clears throat> and also we, we are no longer simply merge these entity mentions with the same name, with the identical surface name. So we're gonna tackle each of them separately, but we also try to figure out their relations. So Washington DC in sentence ABC probably will have different types as output from our methods instead of just one single types or a type distribution. So we want to model each mentions looking at its surface lens as well as its context <clears throat> in a scalable way. And finally, the most important part is we're trying to resolve this relation phrase sparseness problem by jointly clustering them together. And this helps us from the relation phrase groups and these groups is now replace the original single relation phrase. And this group is gonna to propagate the types between different entity candidates in a more effective way. <clears throat> so this is the general framework. Uh, we have the part of speech constraint phrase segmentation techniques that are par partially introduced in before. So the outcome of this method is not only giving us very good entity mentioned candidates, but also given the relation phrases surrounding these entity dimensions altogether. So think about mining these entity dimensions and entity relation phrases. They are not totally independent. The boundary of these two phrases actually, actually are mutually exclusive. Let's say if you already decide the entity dimension boundary, you are not gonna to take the overlap of the other phrase and say that's a relation phrase. So Mining them all together, it's always can help improve the performance. <clears throat> and say, if we have these any dimensions and relation phrase extracted in a quality way, we're gonna build a heterogeneous network here. You have the entity surface names as the, as the object, the relation phrase as another types of object, and also the entity dimensions as an object as well. So then you can try to disambiguate these entity dimensions altogether. Uh, 
it provide so if you review the previous work, they likely can be viewed as you have some relation patterns like the pink ball ones, and you have some surface names like Washington and Kabul, but you are missing this entity mention part, and you have no chance to disambiguate these entity mentions. So for the technical part, we actually argue that the type propagation on the heterogeneous network <coughs> is actually gonna to mutually enhance the process of clustering these relation phrases. Because if you can derive these entity types in a somehow like moderate quality, they're actually serving as features for clustering these relation phrases. On the other hand, if you can better derive these synonymous relation phrases into groups, they're gonna help propagate the type information among the entities, so then you have better entity types. And these two processes, is like bootstrapping process, they help each other and finally lead to good quality um, typed in entity mentions. <clears throat> so for the framework, we're gonna first do this part of speech constraint phrase mining to extract the entity mentions and the relation phrase. We're gonna construct these graphs to encode multiple insights. We're gonna dive into details later. And we collect those uh, entity mentions and then see whether they can be linked confidently to the knowledge base. If, if so, they are, they are linked to the knowledge base and uh, we figure out their types and serve as the seeds for the propagation. And then finally, we will estimate this type indicator for the unlinkable entity candidates. So by doing this, joint propagation and the relation phrase clustering process. The candidate generation, as we say, the rough idea is saying that global significance scores is not enough and the, and the part of speech tag patterns is also not enough. Can we combine them in the principal way? And the trying to say, you want to segment the sentences and uh, during your mer during your greedy merging process, each step, if you want to merge them, you first take a look whether they are significant to merge. And you second, you take a look at the pattern, say if the patterns still follow the way we want, like here for the relation phrase, you, we have the patterns like it's a single verb, it's a preposition, it's a verb plus a preposition, or it's a verb go with several kind of different part of speech tags and then end it with an optional proposition. So if during your merging process, you always satisfy these patterns and you find out that each merging, each step of the merging can generate significant phrases, then it's a very good merging and you finally can get to a entity phrases that's not only globally significant in the corpus but also satisfying the part of speech tag pattern we proposed. <coughs> And these methods can be extending from top my, which is the VLDB 15 papers, to trying to uh, do this in a linear, in, in a very scalable way, and that the complexity is, is only linear to the corporate size. <coughs> the algorithm flow is as follows. So we still first, we might the frequent continuous patterns, and we have this greedy agglomerative merging to enforce the syntactic constraints. On the anti-dimension size, we want it to be consecutive nouns. And you can even easily extend these rule sets by saying you can have some determinators in the, in, in, in the first place and then some numbers of the consecutive ad, um, adjective and then end it with some nouns. So this could also be the easily incorporated in this framework. So for relation phrase, we have the rules shown in this table. So each step is gonna to do this greedy agglomerative merging by looking at both the significant score and the synthetic patterns. Some interesting result we already showed before is that you can find out that um, different entities like Oklahoma and uh, this in international airport, they are extracted while you can find out some of these variation phrases such as the prepositions the verb and can be extracted all together with the entity phrases. And they are actually pretty meaningful if you think about at something 
after add could be a location. It's likely a location and uh, reach some places. It's also likely a location. So the relation phrases actually it's pretty informative in terms of the types of uh, for the surrounding entities. <coughs> so in order to compare this joint anti-dimension and relation phrase extraction approach with traditional MP trunker, we conduct the set of experiments on all three different data sets we care about. The, on the New York Times news data, we have a pretty powerful, uh, we have pretty good results compared to the non-phrase trunker, especially at the record part. And seems the record is the most critical in this stage. Because remember that our typing components can tag the entity candidates as not of interest types. But here, the, uh, here all the positive examples is anti-dimensions, not anti-dimensions of the target types. So if you have high record here uh, and the moderate precisions, you can still have a very good chance to have high precision, precision and recall in the later stage. So we especially we found that on these domain-specific corpus like tweets and Yelp, so we are performing much, much better than MP trunker that are trended on general domain. Usually is the news corpus. So when we have this um, candidate gen already generated out of the corpus, the next stage is to really build the graph that can satisfy the um, assumptions we want. And we still follow the smoothly assumptions that the more two objects are likely to share the same labels, meaning that the large weights should be associated with them in, the connecting, in their connecting edges, no matter what types of the entity, uh, what types of, uh, what kinds of objects they are on these graphs. They always follow in these general assumptions. And if you notice in these graphs, different colors is representing different types of links. We have the links between a mansion and their names. I mean, it's just simply a name and instant matching. And we also have the relations between the relation phrase and the surface names. Thinking about this is like a co-occurrence kind of statistics between the surface name and the relation phrases across all the documents in the corpus. And the third one is the mention correlation links among the entity mentions themselves. The idea of proposing these links is to see whether can we group those entity mentions in terms of their types. If these two Washingtons have pretty similar contacts, it's very likely they are all about either locations or, or government instead of they are having different types in the context. So the, between the mention and surface names, why we want to build up these links? Because we are proposing a model to say, determine the exact type of each entity mentions, looking at two kinds of signals. The first signal is from the type distribution of these surface names in terms of the corpus. Let's say the Washington is a surface name, and from the corpus, it's like 16% refer to as a state, and like 20% refer to as a government, and some other chance to refer to as sport team. And then you have, under, under a certain context, let's, let's look at this sentence, has concerns whether Kabul is allied of Washington. In this special case, you also can find out that it, the Washington core occur with the relation phrase is an ally of. And you also can derive the type distribution for this relation phrase. Let's say it's 80% of government and 20% of a state. So now you have the chance to combine, to intersect these two kinds of signals to finally design that this Washington, in this special case, is referring as a government instead of a location. So that's the major difference from doing this anti-dimension level disambiguations compared to just simply output this Washington surface names types di distribution or the single type for them. So 
how should we build up the relations between entity names and relation phrases? Let's first look at this example here. We, for each relation phrases, actually have two arguments. It has the, it has the left argument, which is the entity mentions occur on the left side of this relation phrase, and it has the right arguments, which is the mentions occur on the right side, and they are actually pretty different. Let's take a look at this one. Um, some serve up something, so the right arguments is very likely of talking about food like beers, cheese steak sandwich, and pizza. And for let's say something is very average on the left side, it's li likely a food, but but something serve up, but th uh, let's say something serve up something. The on the left side of the serve ups, it's likely a person or a restaurant instead of a food. So we trying to distinguish the right arguments with the left arguments. And let's say if in the knowledge base you can easily link pizza, wines, beers to food type, it's gonna propagate through these relation phrases to other unlinkable entities like cheese steak sandwich and, mo and mosaka. <clears throat> That's the basic idea of leverage in the co-occurrence between the entity names and relation phrases. So <clears throat> if we can see two uh, the, uh, an entity names always co-occur with the relation phrases with very high probability, we're gonna assign this high probability as the link weights in, in their relations. <coughs> so finally, how this mention correlation subgraph work here? Let's, let's take White House as an example. So there's totally five different White House mentions in these five different sentences. And you will figure out that actually the second White House has the surrounding context like Obama and birth certificate. And also if you look at the first sentence, when they talk about White House, you can also see Obama and birth certificate. So you are going to think about these two White House should share a very similar context and likely they are sharing very similar types. They are actually, <coughs> it's a, it's an organization or government here. Versus if you look at the third example, the White House is co-occur with other name entities like Rose Garden. This is a, and this Rose Garden also appear in the fourth sentence. So you're gonna see these two White House actually are pretty similar. They're probably sharing the same types. And if you figure out that one of these uh, on, the, on the third sentence, this White House is a location, then this White House is pretty clear. It's also a location between, because the third and fourth example are very similar in terms of their context. So that's how we build this mention correlation graphs. We are trying to check whether two entity dimensions are sharing a lot of similar entity dimensions, and we're trying to build these links representing whether their types are very similar and we can propagate the types between different entity dimensions. So now we have the intuition on propagating the types between entity dimensions, entity names, and relation phrases. So the, the, rest, the, 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 the remaining problem would be how can we combine this relation phrase clustering in a very, in, in a very nice principal network. <coughs> so there's actually um, two things, um, there, there are actually um, two kinds of signals we can explore. <coughs> so if you look at the type signature of the uh, frequent relation phrases, it's actually, <coughs> it's actually pretty clear because a frequent relation phrase is, it's likely co-occur with some seeds and it also co-occur with many unlinkable entities and those unlinkable entities later on can be uh, assigned with pretty confident types labels, and all these signals go back to these frequent relation phrases, and such frequent phrases can propagate in the, their type inf information back to other entity candidates. But for infrequent relation phrases, things will be pretty different. Let's say if, if a relation phrase only co-occur with 
like five or six different entity mentions, and all those mentions are unlinkable. So the dis the tight distribution over those five or six entity mentions will just have full control over the tight distribution of these infrequent phrases. So what if you're trying to class them together to make sure that the signals from frequent relation phrases can also propagate to those infrequent ones to rectify their type distribution to make sure it's not totally biased to some special cases. So that's the major benefit of, of doing this clustering. And um, how can we do this clustering? The first thing we can do is we can do this clustering by looking at the left and right arguments of the relation phrases. If their left and right arguments have um, pretty similar type signature, that's one signal. And also, you can look at how similar these two relation phrases look alike each other. Are they sharing um, the, the strings, like the edit distance of these two relation phrases could be very similar. Then obviously, they are um, similar relation phrase. And you can look at the context world around these relation phrases. So in total, you have at least three kinds of signals to classify class those relation phrases all together. And this can be naturally formulated as a multi-view clustering problem because you have um, different um, um, features, vectors uh, from different perspectives. And you can further generalize to incorporate more signals you can come up with. But all of this can fit in into this multi-view clustering framework <clears throat> so if you take a quick look at these object, objective functions, the um, components of the, objective, of the optimization problem is pretty clear. You have the first terms is trying to capture in the smoothness assumption, meaning that um, if we already construct the graph between entity names, entity mentions, and the relation phrase, and those links really make sense, then these terms is trying to say, OK, I'm going to propagate the types between those um, links we build um, using this term. And this part is trying to capture the mentions disambiguation, which is the type propagation between the entity mentions. is captured by the entity mentions subgraph. And this, um, this term is trying to say, could we um, cluster those relation phrases based on different features we have and notice that the, end, the, the arguments of the relation phrases, which is the types of the entity mentions, is actually one um, feature for this relation phrase clustering. So you bridge all of this together to share the information. So, so I know this uh, formula looks very horrible, but um, it's actually pretty durable to optimize. You can just simply ultimate minimize them based on this broad coordinate algorithm. And we, find, we, we just summarize this for you. This algorithm complexity is actually just linear to the entity dimensions, number of entity dimension, number of the relation phrases, the number of the relation phrase clusters you want, and the, the number of clustering features. So let's take a look at some interesting results we have. So because we want to check whether um, our red methods can really work on either the general domain and also some very specific domain. So we tried New York Times from 2013, which is a general domain example. And we also tried Yelps and Tweets. And we have the C mentions uh, linked to the free base entities. <clears throat> but only 7% of this entity mentioned we extracted can be linked to um, free base entity. So it's a very small portion. <clears throat> so we manually annotate dimensions to try to check out this precision we call an F1. All these are traditional name entity recognitions evaluation metrics. And we compare it to a very rich set of baselines, including Stanford pattern-based learning. It's a representation of the bootstrapping pattern methods, and also the contextual classifier method. And distance is supervised label propagation method and uh, and a lot of the relevance of our methods trying to check each component in the graph it's meaningful so we have um, 
these numbers here, the interesting thing is here. Um, you can see actually we are not performing that much um, improvements when on this general domain corpus. We still have, um, we, I think the best performing baseline is on ADA and we have 93. But you, if you look at the performance on the specific domain, for example, the Yelp domain, we actually are more than 50% better than the best performing baseline in, in these cases. <clears throat> that's, the, that's the major power come from in, um, one is come from in the candidate generation part because we are not losing a lot of record in that case. So we still have pretty good record as you can observe here. Also, our methods is gonna try to disam disambiguate those engine names while the, all these methods that trying to say just output one or multiple types for each entity names so they are losing a lot of information here <clears throat> we even break down this performance into different types and see how the methods uh, can perform on different types as you can see here organization actually is pretty ambiguous entity types many uh, in many cases, when you look at an entity, you, as a human, you actually need to think about whether it's referred as an organization or locations. So if you don't do any disambiguations to the entity mentions, so basically, like these two bases, like the green one and yellow one, they are losing a lot of performance on the organization types. So same things also happen on the product type here. And people will argue that um, can you have a, what, what's the performance you can have on a general domain even compared to those standard um, sequence models or classifiers like Stanford NER. So we do, do the testing on not only the New York Times corpus but also the domain specific corpus and try to see the performance gains we, we achieve from each domain. So Stanford NER has this F1 measure of 0.68 it's kind of it's it it's it's similar to the numbers they reported in <coughs> in the recent paper, but our methods actually are doing pretty well. We can achieve a almost ninety five percent of these um, F one measures, while we still largely outperform than uh, on the Yelp and Twitch data set. But as you can see, when we um, when we switch to those domestic corpus obviously we are going to lose the precision we cause because the irregular grammar and all, this, all these things will <coughs> make things more challenging. So here's the example would say, um, what, is the, what if we trying to type, uh, recognize and type the same, same sentence or text fragment and compare the results given by different methods. We take the real preview as example. So we can find out this barbecue as food, fitness as a location, and we can find out this interesting phrase like pool pork sandwich as a food, coleslaw as a food, bake, bake it beans. But when you look at this semantic tagger, it's a contextual classifier. The major problem is that it's assigned all the entity names with the same types. That's because this context classifier is very, is very sensitive to the type distribution of the seeds. So if you are gonna, if you, let's say 60% of the seeds you provided to the corpus is about location, the very likely the, the classifier will just buy all the things to locations in this sense. So you need to pay much attention to the distribution of the labels when using this contextual classifier. And, and then PLB is a distance supervised label propagation methods core problem is it's not, try, it's not even identifying those interesting entity phrases because they are assuming the noun phrases is pre-extracted by some general noun phrase chunker, but the noun phrase chunker is fail, fails in the Yelp review domain. It cannot find pool pork sandwich, but only find the sandwich, and it cannot find baked beans, but only find the beans and lunch and so on. <coughs> so on the left, Left downside, so this is what we show what, what uh, our relation phrase clustering is really working well. 
So we've print out some of these clusters. The first one is about um, it's about like recruited by employee by want hired by. I've showed the frequency of this region for instance in corpus, and you will see it's able to put very frequent relation phrase like, like recruited by together with some infrequent ones. And this cluster means they share the same type signature, meaning that the entity appear on the left side or the right side of these relation phrases should have the same types. So this relation phrase cl cluster is really helpful to trying to resolve the context sparsity issue. So this case study <coughs> we have done is trying to look specifically on how much performance gains we can have if the context sparsity issue is really severe in the data set. And also, what if the surface name um, ambiguities also are very severe problem. So we have two query groups. The first one is, is to have a it's to have a pretty, uh, it's kind of moderate frequent um, contextual pattern. Um, so then actually the context sparsity is not severe there versus the group B, the entity phrases, they're always curving with some infrequent relation phrases. So without doing any relation phrase clustering, as you can see from these two baselines, they actually perform, don't perform uh, pretty much. And we have this class type two steps and class type no class. These two methods are actually doesn't do any relation phrase clustering and you can see they are, their performance drops a lot. On the surface name popularity side, we partition the queries into two groups. So the entity mentioned is group one uh, is pretty popular in the corpus and on the second one is less popular in the corpus. So you can also see there's a big performance trade-off between different methods. So I think it's better for us to summarize this part. Yes. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot for painfully plowing through, you know, all those formulas and, uh, and the details. <laughs> yeah, so the generally I should say, because the time is over there, uh, one interesting thing is you probably can see these two things we combine together. Uh, to mine the unstructured data, finally you can recognize the entities and types then you can construct, for example, typed heterogeneous networks. You can do a lot of very powerful things on the unstructured data, which actually is a very core problem in, in NLP. I think it's also a very core problem in data mining. So to that extent, I think the, the conclusion and future work is very obvious. So I don't want to even uh, lecture it in detail. I just say this one opened up a new scope, simply says, we got uh, the majority of data, okay, 80%, 90% are unstructured data locked in those human uh, created ambiguous data sets, okay. But we want to, to take them to dig knowledge out of it. And it's a very hard problem, uh, but I think uh, fortunately uh, with our group, you know, a few very talented PhD students they work out the phrase mining, then they work out typing. It all op almost opened a new, you know, for new horizon for us to dig in. Okay, uh, I actually the two weeks ago I gave a talk in uh, in ACL. They got uh, very astonished because like Sean's method, uh, the NLP people were taking uh, like a Stanford NER, take a FIGER like a University of Washington those methods almost like a really flagship of their methods. And, and uh, Sean's methods see, you can see the very big difference. Okay, what's the power it got? Okay, the very interesting thing, if you observe it is, uh, the previous methods, the NLP people work really, really hard. They take one document, they try to beat it to death. Okay, and we cannot do that. Okay, or we don't want to follow exactly the trail. We took, bulky, bulky math documents. That means we take many, many of them. Uh, we got, they give us one, we'll be dead, okay? But they give us many. This is like we lock in the cell for a year, okay? Then we gradually understand it. We 
take the correlation, we take all the, you know, the propagation, take a, a phrase, uh, you know, like a relationship, clustering, and all these, we finally, we will be able to log up this very big data. Finally, we can turn them into more structural one, okay? Of course, this is just uh, the, the, the first uh, several piece of work. Uh, the good news is, I think they are, uh, we load many, many things down there. You can see uh, sec phrase is in GitHub, which is open source. Uh, top mine is also in GitHub, and uh, uh, they get all the things. That means we open up the source, anybody can dig in, okay? You, you can work on it, you can, you can download the code, uh, you can move things forward, okay? It doesn't mean we, this one, we, we work it out, you will not be able to beat us. I think, uh, I believe, you know, once we open up, uh, more people will jump in. Uh, you can beat us, but you can move things forward because we get so huge tax corpora. And we want to mine them, we want to make good progress. I think the nice thing is for this data mining community, we jump in, we actually have our tool, we have our power. Uh, of course, we compete with the uh, NRP community, but we also have to learn quite a lot from them because they dig deeper, okay? So but anyway, I think this is uh, interesting. Uh, we don't have time for, uh, for questions, but feel free, during the conference, those people are all here. You can discuss with us. Thank you.